How great is it to have Michael Chandler in the house, huh, guys? Um, I'd like to start about, like, a lot of times they see your success. A lot of times people uh, assume that it's an overnight success, right? I think we can all relate to that. It happens in, as an athlete. It happens in business. So let's talk about your road to where you are now. Uh, clearly, you're at an incredible moment in your career. So let's talk about how you got there. I've been fighting now for 15 years, but before that, uh, wrestled in college, or wrestled in college, but before that, wrestled in high school. You know, my story is very much the small guy from the small town who was taught to do small things. So I'm currently trying to still today, a work in progress to break out of that mold. Um, but yes, I came to the UFC, which is the biggest platform in mixed martial arts, about three years ago. Basically came out of nowhere to a lot of people, but it had been the 20 years of grinding before that uh, that led me to that moment. And yes, it was the fight, I guess, technique. It was the X's and O's of mixed martial arts, but I truly believe that at your greatest moment of opportunity, it's where opportunity and platform meet reputation. So I think over the 20 years that I had, the relationship capital that I had created, the following and the platform, the trust um, that I had created with the fan base, the mixed martial arts fan base, where my reputation stayed very high and the platform just continued to grow, 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 and then it exploded and it intersected at a place where it took me to a, a, a very great platform. Um, but I was not, not very much different than probably a lot of people in this room from a small town. Um, and I was an undersized guy. I wasn't gonna be the star quarterback. I wasn't gonna be the star point, point guard. So I uh, had to wrestle, you know. We had to wrestle, right? <laughs> we had to wrestle uh, and uh, parlayed that into a, a college wrestling career, walked on. So I started out as the lowest guy on the totem pole at the University of Missouri and uh, eventually became an All-American. And, and then that propelled me into trying mixed martial arts because I didn't want to join the job force right away. I wanted to continue to compete. And then here we are 15 years later and it's, uh, it's working out. So I know that you had an incredible run, the first 12. Then you had a loss, and then another loss, another loss. So 688 days. That's a breaking point for a lot of people. And, you know, I'm sure it was a rough two years. So what did you do from a mindset and a coach and a people around you? Because what happens at that point, that's when your support network comes in. Whoever, you know, and that's actually... It's easy when things are going well. I mean, I know you how hard you train, but at, that, at those low points, and we've all had them, could be all kinds of stuff, we hit low points. What was it? What did you do differently that, that made you come out of that period of time? Because that breaks a lot of people. Yeah, I, I think, you know, 688 day, days without winning a fight, losing three in a row is all but a death sentence in, of a career in mixed martial arts. Um, Everybody had written me off, and I, uh, I admit it was very tough to hear it in the media, start, start uh, agreeing with the media that I wasn't who they all thought I was. Uh, I wasn't the champion that, I w that they thought I was. I was eventually going to fall off. But I think really what happened was I could do all the reps in the gym. I could train harder than anybody else. If coach tells, tells me to run through that brick wall, and I run through that brick wall every single day, I do more than what is asked for me of me. I put all the physical work in, but if I'm not actually focusing on what is going on in between my ears, then I'm really just building up a bigger, faster, su bigger, faster, stronger, subpar version of the man that I was created to be. If I'm not winning the battle in between my ears, if I'm not taking extreme ownership of everything that is going on inside my mind. So if, you, if, if we are what we are and where we are because of what is gone in, going, going on inside of our mind and what has gone into our mind, then it is, it is the most important part of not just mixed martial arts, but business, relationship, finances, every single aspect of our life. So I just went, I went from thinking, okay, as long as I just do everything in the gym and I work extremely hard, I'll be successful, to saying, okay, yeah, that's very important, but the mindset side of things was so much more important. And admittedly, looking back on my Looking back on my run and, and even, you know, talking about my upbringing and how I, how I grew up, the self-image that I had, there was more often than not, I looked in the mirror and, and saw a man that I was not 100%, that I 100% didn't believe in. 
A lot of times I looked in the mirror at a man who didn't deserve success. A lot of times I looked in the mirror and, and I would tell you, I'd sit here and tell you and essentially lie to you saying I was, wanted to be a world champion or I could beat this guy or I could beat that guy or I want to be number one in the world, but I didn't really truly believe it because you'll never be able to consistently perform in a manner that is inconsistent with the way that you see yourself. You'll never, you'll, and that consistently is the most important part of that because you're going to find success every now and then without a positive self-image, without a, a very a very highly regarded self-concept. But to find that consistent success, you have to be working more on the mindset, more on the visualization, more on the self-belief and the self-image um, than the actual physical side of things. And that's in mixed martial arts, that's in business, that's in our relationships, that's in everything. Because you're always gonna find a way out and you're always gonna find a way to self-sabotage if your self-image isn't at the level at which you are trying to, at, at which you, the level at which you are trying to seek. Um, so I just really, re I hired a sports psychologist for the first time. I sat, in a, sat on a, a, a couch like this and started talking about it. We put together tangible, practical things that I could do. We started visualizing a lot, started journaling a lot, starting, started really being okay with loving myself. Started really being okay with talking to myself and patting myself on the back. I had a conversation earlier about patting yourself on the back. Everyone in this room is here because you want to find ridiculous levels of success. You want to level up your game. But every time you level up, every time you have a success, don't be afraid to say, I'm proud of you. Look in the mirror and say, I am proud of you. You should be proud of yourself. The story that you've been telling yourself in the past doesn't have to be the story of your future. Because that's what I always did. I would, I, would win a, I would win a match, or I would win a fight, or I would find a new accolade, or I would win another award. But every single time, it was, okay, head down, don't focus on that move on to the next thing, but you have to take the time to smell the roses and be proud of yourself and love yourself. And I did not do a good job of that. And there's a fine line because we can all fall into narcissism. We can all fall into having too, too big of an ego. But for the most part, there's no, there is nothing wrong with absolutely being proud of yourself and loving yourself. And I've, you know, gotten much better at self-love, self-belief, which continues to compound on itself and leads me into the next accolade, the next fight, the next win, and ultimately the, a better life. Thank you. Um, <laughs> much, much job, right? Love yourself, man. Yeah. Love yourself. It's the best. You know? Yeah, yeah.